This episode is brought to you by Dashlane. Try Dashlane Premium free for 30 days at dashlane.com slash infographics and never forget another password and keep all your online accounts secure. The United States has a long history of decrying censorship and propaganda, with the very idea of either being antithetical to American values. Yet with any government organization in the world, the Pentagon does in fact engage in subtle censorship, or at times even propaganda, though never quite reaching the level seen in North Korea, China, or Russia. Just how does the Pentagon subtly manipulate public opinion, and how egregious are its censorship and propaganda efforts really? Hello and welcome to another episode of The Infographics Show. Today we're taking taking a look at how the Pentagon censors film and media. As we mentioned, censorship and propaganda are antithetical to American values, so while you will never find the hardcore propaganda parroted by nationalistic newspapers in Russia and China, the fact is that the Pentagon does engage in subtle manipulation of the media for its own benefit. The reasons why are simple. The US military is, unlike most militaries, a purely volunteer force. Therefore, if public opinion dips, then its ability to recruit also dips. Secondly, because the military is overseen by a civilian leadership negative opinions of the military can directly impact its budget, and so therefore, it is important for the Pentagon to present a positive and professional image of itself whenever it can. Generally, this has resulted in a fairly light touch, but other times the Pentagon's influence over national media has raised some eyebrows, especially when it's been caught revising history for its favor. But just how does the Pentagon do this? Decades ago, the Pentagon recognized that the most powerful weapon in America's arsenal was not its nuclear bombs or mighty military, but rather its culture. Many would argue and decry the fact that the US has no culture, while snootily sipping a frappuccino with their pinky held up. Yet those same people who claim the US has no culture are almost certainly wearing American fashions, listening to American music on American software, and are planning on going to see the latest American movie, which they'll enjoy while eating eating and drinking some American-made snacks. The US is a mass producer of culture, everything from fine art to mass consumer trinkets and snacks, yet nothing compares to the power of Hollywood when it comes to shaping minds around the world. Everywhere you go on this planet, you're almost guaranteed to have at least one popular film quote in common with somebody else, and that's all thanks to Hollywood. The Pentagon is at its core a peacekeeping organization and prefers to win wars by never having to wage them in the first place. This can be accomplished through sheer technological and military superiority or by helping to propagate American culture around the world. After all, you don't typically want to fight what you like. To this end, the Pentagon maintains a slew of liaisons who work with Hollywood itself, helping to connect filmmakers with Pentagon officials and to aid in the accuracy of film scripts. The Pentagon very much works on an exchange basis, making military resources such as aircraft, locations, and personnel available in exchange for specific tweaks to scripts. Typically those tweaks that the Pentagon asks for are subtle and not outrageously over-the-top propaganda. For example, after the Veterans Administration administration released a report stating that the US's servicemen's suicide rate was double that of a civilian's during the Iraq War. The Pentagon requested that the mentions of soldier suicide be scrapped or limited within film or TV show scripts. Other times, though, the Pentagon can become full-on revisionist, as in the TV film based on the capture of Jessica Lynch, the female US Army soldier who was captured while fighting in Iraq. In the film, Pentagon changes to the script showed Lynch as fighting her captors before she was taken, but in reality, Lynch herself said that she was terrified and curled up inside her Humvee while the firefight was taking place. Another edit by the Pentagon portrayed the Special Forces soldiers who rescued Lynch as being under fire during their dramatic escape, but in reality the operation was a relatively smooth and simple affair. While such edits to history are rather benign and clearly made for dramatic or heroic effect, they are still of concern to people who worry about the Pentagon going full-on revisionist on US history. Although these tweaks are certainly a far cry from the full-blown propaganda other nations engage in daily. So what other famous films has the Pentagon meddled with? In 1957, Warner Brothers asked for Pentagon support during their filming of Sayonara, a film about two Air Force pilots who were stationed in Japan and fall in love with Japanese women. The men faced hostility from within the Air Force for their marriage to Japanese women, as the film is set shortly after the end of World War II, and in the end, the lead actor and his wife end up committing suicide rather than being forced to separate. The Pentagon was initially 
very reluctant to provide any support to the film due to the sensitive nature of interracial dating and the suicide of one of its servicemen. This was, after all, 1950s America, and the wounds of World War II were still fresh in many people's minds, as was the conflict against North Korea just seven years prior. It was feared that a backlash against the film would result in backlash against the military as well, and the idea of a U.S. serviceman committing suicide was completely outrageous to 1950s American society. For the average Joe, the U.S. serviceman was the epitome of machismo, the victor of World War II and the guarantor of global freedom not a conflicted individual whose heart could be so broken he would kill himself. In the end, the film was granted support by the U.S. Air Force, as it was the military's policy at the time that fraternization with occupied people and the Japanese were still considered to be occupied was forbidden, as was interracial marriage. Yet many involved with the production of the film, including James Meichner, the World War II veteran writer of the film, had to fight to keep the purity of the script intact from Pentagon liaisons, seeking to curb what was at the time considered the outrageous outrageousness of interracial marriage and soldier suicide. Four years later, the film The Outsider would go into production in 1961, telling the story of Ira Hayes, who was one of the six Marines who was pictured in the famous Raising the Flag on Iwo Jima photo. He was the only Native American amongst the six, and in the years following the war descended into a deep depression and alcoholism brought on by his experiences in World War II. His fame after the war for taking part in the flag-raising photo also weighed on him, with great guilt brought on by the fact that most of his friends never made it back home alive. While he was being taken to dinners at the White House and fancy galas everywhere while being called a hero. In January 1955, he died of alcohol poisoning and exposure to cold after collapsing outside while drunk. When he died, many pointed the finger of blame at the Marine Corps for failing to help Hayes with his various problems. While the Marines and the U.S. government had been happy to exploit Hayes during their war bond drives to raise cash for the war effort, as soon as the war was done, they completely ignored Hayes' worsening health. Eventually, testimony by Marine Corps generals themselves agreed that the Corps shared a great deal of blame in his death. The outsider told the story of Hayes' life after his famous photo and ended with his tragic death. Despite the very negative portrayal of the Marine Corps and the hit to public opinion that they would take, the Corps nevertheless fully supported the film effort. However, in exchange for their support, they did request that filmmakers tone down Hayes' final death scene, a move which signaled a change in Pentagon policy when it came to portraying the death of its heroes on screen. In 1978, the Jane Fonda film Coming Home also sought Pentagon support for its production, but was flatly denied. It's likely that this is because military suicides had been spiking due to the war in Vietnam, but it's also because of the very negative public opinion the military had earned itself for the ongoing conflict in Southeast Asia. While initially seeking to barter use of military resources for the changing of certain elements of the script, the Pentagon would ultimately decide to deny any support to the film, most notably because of references to U.S. Marines cutting off ears of dead Viet Cong, an officer committing suicide due to his war experiences, and a paralyzed Vietnam vet attacking a group of Marines. The film would go on to temper several of these elements, but ultimately the Pentagon still denied any official support to the filmmakers. In 1992, the film A Few Good Men also saw Pentagon support, but would go on to be denied. The film is a courtroom drama featuring two Marines who face a court-martial for accidentally killing one of their fellow Marines during an unsanctioned discipline session and evolves into a story of corruption within a military unit with an out-of-control commander. Surprisingly, the Pentagon did not have objections with the core subject of the film, but instead objected to Navy characters saying hours when referring to times, such as 10 hundred hours, because it's an army way of telling time. They wanted Tom Cruise's character to be a Marine and not a Navy officer, and they weren't fans of Demi Moore, who had recently shot a nude portrait for a magazine cover while pregnant. The Pentagon also objected to the suicide of one of the film's most important characters and the negative nature of his suicide note. Once more, the Pentagon was leery of having its soldiers portrayed as humans who might at times take their own lives. Ultimately, the filmmakers tried to work with the Hollywood liaison with the Pentagon on changes that might be acceptable to the military, but in the end, Aaron Sorkin refused to change the suicide scene or letter, as it would have undercut the entire drama of the story. This resulted in the Pentagon polling most official support, aside from some brief film at military locations for establishing shots. While the Pentagon does engage in what could be considered censorship, it's clear that its activities are a far cry from the full-blown propaganda that many other modern nations employ. In the end, it's obvious that the Pentagon wants to be seen in the best light possible, but for anyone concerned with Stalinist censorship from
from the most powerful military organization in the world, you can rest assured that the officials at the Pentagon still find blatant propaganda and censorship as anti-American as its citizens do. However the dark web started, it's here to stay, which means that you better have some serious protection against anyone who's looking to exploit it for nefarious purposes. Don't forget, you are their target. We at the Infographics Show have been keeping ourselves protected using Dashlane. Dashlane is the one and only tool you need to not just keep your personal info and digital accounts safe and secure, but their dark web monitoring services will immediately notify you if it finds any of your personal information for sale on an online marketplace, so you can take steps to protect yourself right away. Don't be like millions of victims. Get Dashlane and keep your digital life secure right now. Head on over to dashlane.com slash infographics for a free 30-day trial. And if you use the coupon code infographics, you can get 10% off a premium subscription today. What films do you think the Pentagon had a hand in editing? Also, check out our other video, Why the U.S. Military Can't Quit Windows XP. See you next time.